Garrett Trap now is uh, not from a poverty ridden background. He was from a town named after his family. His uncle was a general in the army that served under MacArthur. His father attended the U.S. Naval Academy and retired a commander before going into business. His mother didn't have a job outside the home. He was not poor in any sense of the word. Still, he went bad. His main claims to fame was skyjacking, attempted helicopter escape from a supermax prison, and inspiring a woman into hijacking a plane in a failed attempt to free him from prison. I have, or will, deal with these other incidents in separate videos. In this video, I'd like to talk about the life of crime before the big incidents. To explore his life, uh, that sounds more like an adventure film than real life, how a rich kid goes bad. He first stole some shoes when he was 14 in an exclusive Balboa club in Panama City, Panama. He had his first, but far from his last, police record right then. He was attending the Miami Military Academy with the other rich kids when he decided to join the Army in October of 1955. As any vet can attest, the Army is full of rules and they don't take kindly to rebel rich kids. This led to trouble early on for Trapnell. General John Hall Trapnell, his uncle, made fun of him by saying that he was the first in the family to attain the rank of private. One night, he returned four hours late on a pass and was charged with AWOL. That's A-W-O-L or absent without leave for non-military types. Rather than live with military disgrace, he shot himself in the belly with a 25 auto Saturday night special. He didn't die, but he spent almost two months in the hospital recovering from this injury. The army in Trapnell called it an accident, and that ain't what it was. His first attempt to kill himself was he was 17 years old. After this incident, he went AWOL on a regular basis. Even going so far as to forge his own passes, he was caught, court-martialed, and discharged in 1957. He went to California and fraudulently re-enlisted in the Army. In less than a year, he was promoted to corporal and was even helping train new recruits. But the Army background detected the fraud and Trapnell was court-martialed again and sentenced to the stockade. His insubordination soon earned him 30 days in the hole. After he got out of segregation, his mouth got him in another 30 days, you know, in the hole. But this time, he had a small bit of razor blade that he used to cut his wrists in his second attempt at suicide. This time they sent him to the nut house for four months in the, at the Presidio in San Francisco. After that, he was discharged in March 1958. It was the end of an inglorious military career. Trapnell said that it, he never failed the army, but it was the army's fault and that they had failed him. I've noticed that most losers feel this way. They are not losers, it's just the world fails to recognize their greatness. Take my advice, it's much easier to change yourself than to change the world. Now he was an out of work soldier. The next logical step was for him to find a nice war to be involved in. So he went to Cuba to help Fidel Castro fight as a rebel in the hills. What he got was caught and spent several months in the squalid Baptista prison. One day at dawn, he was marched out, tied to a post, and a firing squad was lined up right in front of him. At the word fire, he heard the hammers fall on empty chambers, then the entire squad burst out laughing at him. He was kicked out of the country. Literally, a mocked failure. He got a job working for the Greyhound in Florida. Through his employer, he rented a discount vehicle and headed west across America. In the vicinity of Barstow, California, he picked up two hitchhikers, Len Tillotson, a teenager, and Warren Meadow, a 31-year-old man. As the three drove down the highway, heading, you know, nowhere in particular, they decided to start robbing people, of, of course. Uh, Trapnell would show that he had uh, what it took first, you know, to do the robbing. 
After heading east for some time, they stopped in Gallup, New Mexico. Trapnell noticed a gas station that looked like a good place to rob. He planned and executed the robbery like a military mission. He parked two blocks away, leaving the two hitchhikers to stay with the car. At the station on Route 366, he held up the attendant, made him open the till, and then locked him in the bathroom. He took the $126 in cash and calmly walked back to the getaway car. The cops were looking for one robber headed east out of town. They drove right past the three men as they drove into town. In Des Moines, Iowa, he ran out of money and this time he and Meadow, disguised as hobos, held up a finance company for 300 bucks. They tied up the employees with shoelaces and made their getaway, uh, made their successful getaway after they uh, changed into different clothing. The three robbers hated each other and Trapnell dumped them on the side of the road before he was caught in Raleigh, North Carolina. Like all rich and influential families, the Trapnells had a lawyer, Uncle Waters to Garrett, but Franklin Waters Trapnell Esquire to the rest of the world. Rather than go to prison for decades, Uncle Waters decided to play up mental illness in Garrett. If it could be proven he had a mental defect, he could be free much sooner. Garrett knew that he was not insane, but if he could be proven insane, then he understood that he would not be held legally responsible for the string of robberies. With this in mind, he entered Maryland Spring Grove State Hospital in late 1958. For months, no, for two months, Garrett observed the other mental patients and mimicked them. He had no formal training in mental illness, but he was a quick study. He even stood and looked out the window now and then and faked a total break with reality. He yelled at imaginary armies doing battle on the lawn. His two partners in the robberies were castigated by the judge for trying to lay the blame on the man who was so obviously incapable of rational thought. He gave him 20 years in a penitentiary. Garrett spent two months in the hospital and it was the opinion of the staff that he was severely mentally ill. The breaks with reality were caused by his mother's alcoholism and the death of his father when he was young. Garrett was a poor, sick man who was not responsible for his actions. He needed treatment, not prison. After the report was sent to the court, the treatment began, mostly of him taking medicine. He had one incident of a fight with a patient, but other than that, you know, that one thing early on, he was a model patient, compliant. After a few months, he was transferred from the criminally insane ward to the regular mental patient ward. After six months in the hospital, his uncle Waters took him to a very fancy wedding in which no expense was spared. It was his cousin's wedding, and the opulence of the affair was marked contrast to the squalid surroundings of the state mental hospital. Still, hospital is better than prison. After one year of treatment, he made a remarkable recovery and was released from the hospital and the supervision of the court. Not a bad deal, one year in a mental ward as opposed to 20 years in the state penitentiary for robbery. After being released from the hospital, he, he got a job with the airline Pan Am. But it didn't last long when they found out about that year in the nut house and the string of robberies that he forgot to tell them. Uh, about the same time you know, he was unemployed, his girlfriend became pregnant. It was the 50s, so he did the right thing and he married the girl. He got a job as a door-to-door -door salesman. He and his new bride uh, fought a lot. You know, when the baby miscarried, so the marriage, you know, the, the marriage just went down the drain and they guess got it annulled. Uh, the marriage and the baby is uh, just both like they never really happened. You know, like the, the marriage and the and the the child ceased to exist, I guess. Seems awful sad. He went to San Francisco, dropped six grand in worthless checks, and beat it out of town in less than two days. He went to Baltimore to see a girl, of course. When that didn't work out the way he had hoped, he bought a toy gun and went to Towson Police Department, just north of Baltimore, and pointed the toy gun at the desk sergeant, hoping to get the cops to kill him. They just kicked his ass, took the toy gun, 
put him in a cell. He slashed his wrists again while he was in there and they put him in another mental hospital until early 1962. The same as the last time he faked being crazy until the court was convinced. Then he made a quick recovery and was out the door and on his way to the next adventure. He got a new job in Miami on a and a new wife, Gretchen Wegman. She was a stunning daughter of a former chief of staff of Hitler's Wehrmacht of the last war. The job didn't last when they found out about his criminal and record and his hospitalization. The couple had a daughter. He worked many jobs, traveled for no purpose, and ended up in trouble and back into another mental ward. His new wife didn't want him back in their daughter's life, so Garrett went back on the road this time he started a scam as a fake New Mexico cop. He faked a car, uniform, radio, and badge. He pulled over state cars, you know, out of state cars. He pulled over out of state cars and took a $20 bribe to let them go. He did it for months. During the day, he was a tourist on vacation at the local motel and went fishing. From midnight to 2 a.m., he was a fake cop accepting bribes. Until one night, a car he just wrote a ticket to was pulled over by the only real state cop on the famous Route 66 in New Mexico that night. The conversation showing the receipt he just received and the fact that the uniforms and car looked different led to an investigation by the real cop. Benjamin Case was his name. The state cop, he took up the challenge. He traced Garrett's movements nightly. Garrett was warned by a story about the case in the local paper. He kept his eye open and only fleeced out-of-state cars. Finally, one night, he took a break, stripped his car and himself of all the official police stuff, and took a nap. He was woken by several cops with guns drawn on him. It took three months to catch him. Given six months in the county jail for impersonating an officer, he made about ten grand on the scam. He used a plastic toy pistol and a plastic badge that he got at the dollar store. After he was out of jail, he went to Houston, Texas, where he wrote up $15,000 in bad checks and headed to Canada. He was caught in a stolen car full of guns just outside Montreal. While in jail, he swallowed a spoon and was sent to a hospital where he romanced a pretty nurse by the name of Marie Corot. Canada sends mental defectives back to their home country where the day after being signed into a mental hospital, Garrett signed himself out of it and returned to Canada. This time he went in uniform of a U.S. Army captain. His new wife loved the bad boy gangster. They were married and went, you know, to, to live in Houston, where he spent lavishly on her with bad checks. Her daddy found out what kind of a fake Army officer nut and fraud he was. The RCMP was called contacted Houston and the honeymoon ended in the city jail for Garrett. Daddy's little girl scampered home. This time he convinced the court psychologist that he thought he was an army colonel on a secret mission to bring peace to the Middle East and the doctor was obviously a CIA agent sent to stop his mission. He was sent to the state mental hospital in Austin. He got another inmate to get his girlfriend and to get him a hacksaw blade. He used it to cut the lock and mesh over the third story window. He used sheets in the laundry room to make a rope. He slid to the ground, ran across the quad, climbed the fence, you know, with the barbed wire top, crossed the highway and checked into the motel across the street. When the alarm sounded of the escape, he called a cab from his room and had them take him to the airport. By 10.30 p.m., he was airborne and free. It took him an hour and a half. The plane took him to San Antonio. He wrote a bunch of bad checks to fund his transportation to Miami. It took the FBI a while to find out, you know, about him and put him back in the mental hospital in Florida. He was living a life of luxury, paid for with bad checks and other scams just before his arrest in the hospital. He met George Padilla, the man he would demand be released from custody when he hijacked the TWA flight a few years later. He was transferred to another hospital for the criminally insane in Miami. Somehow he obtained a key to a secure door and after midnight he walked through the wards of insane criminals and asked who wanted to go. Sixteen dangerous criminally insane people and Garrett left that night. It took two days to catch all the other nuts, but they couldn't find Garrett. He'd rented a car with money his mama gave him. 
wrote a bunch of bad checks and left town with over 3,000 bucks. All the nuts who he had opened the door for uh, told who, who had done it. The cops were not amused. He moved to L.A., met and married Susan by telling her that he was a retired U.S. Army captain who was wounded in Vietnam. He loved, oh, uh, her family loved Garrett and got him to job selling cleaning supplies. He did an excellent job and even opened his own cleaning business that netted him an additional $1,500 a month. He wrote 10 grand worth of checks that were bogus, bought two cars and a boat. He filled them all with all the stuff that they could hold that he bought on credit and took his wife and hit the road. She and her bad boy were now on the run. Her life of romance and adventure had finally begun. They went to Miami. She drove the getaway car when they broke uh, George Padilla out of the nut house. They took the two cars, cars and the boat and settled in Lake George, New York to a life of leisure on the stolen goods and money. Must have been a lot of fun holed up with two escaped men from a hospital for the criminally insane. She uh, had certainly found her bad boy. After a couple of weeks eating steaks on the bank of the lake, they decided to go to Montreal, Canada and rob the Royal Bank, of course. George and Garrett stuck up the bank and left with sacks of money. They stashed the cash in the boat and went back to Lake George. George took the bus back since the cops would be looking for two men together. Back at the hideout, they gave George eight grand in Canadian money and he hit the road. Susan and Garrett went back to eating steak on the banks of the lake in the rented cabin. It all came crashing down when they were arrested in a Howard Johnson in Bolton's Landing, New York. The bad boy had gotten arrested and facing a sentence of 20 years for bank robbery. George had screwed up at the bank and the gas station attendant had seen all three of them and had given the cops good descriptions and license plate numbers. The FBI was able to trace all the information to the little cabin on the lake and Garrett. He was put in a New York jail and the Canadians sent the police, you know, to take him back to Montreal. One problem they forgot was that Garrett is smart. He lodged a complaint with his congressman. He claimed that the RCMP had no jurisdiction in the USA. His being taken by them all the way from the jail in New York to Montreal was kidnapping. An international incident occurred. Diplomats in both countries fretted and wrung their hands. It was decided to release Garrett, apologies to him, and send him home on a first class plane. All charges dropped. They even gave him the money back that he took from the bank. The FBI missed him at the airport in New York. They had warrants from three states in hand. Garrett caught a plane to St. Louis, Missouri within five minutes of hitting the ground. From there, he went back to Miami and surprised Susan by being free. They hit the road, living the life on, living the, life on the run. It finally got to them both and Garrett turned himself into the cops in LA. He made bail then after, and jumped it after three months. He went to L.A., wrote a few thousand dollars worth of bad checks, finally came back, rented a U-Haul, and filled it with lumber and dog food. He was off on a new adventure with Susan to Baltimore. He started a guard, dog, and security firm. When Martin Luther King was shot, Baltimore was in flames, and his business couldn't keep up with demand. He bought 16 acres outside the city for his dogs. He worked with the local police department with security dogs. Had his business in the paper, invited kids from Baltimore's less affluent neighborhoods to come to his dog farm and play. The business went well and made him lots of money and more important, got him a line of credit. He was calling himself Jim Stewart now, you know, like Jimmy Stewart, Jim Stewart. Um, one day, several of the dogs were shot and killed. He sold the business for pennies on the dollar, used his line of credit to buy a car with a cell phone in the back, a big boat, an entire house of furniture, and lots of other expensive stuff. Uh, he had it all shipped to San Francisco and then skipped down. Later, the business burned and killed all the dogs at one time. Big insurance payout to the new owner smelled like fraud to him, but it was no longer his concern. He took a new name in San Francisco, James cross the name of his old partner in the dog guard business he lived in an apartment with a boat dock the furniture he bought in baltimore was in the apartment life was all luxury again with his pregnant wife susan he bought a 1968 cougar 
When his boat wasn't big enough, he went to Miami and rented one with a vehicle to tow it. Naturally, the checks he wrote were rubber. When he ran out of cash, he was in L.A. cashing checks at little grocery stores. $10,000 in a weekend in L.A. was not an unusual haul for him. He finally got bored with this life. He sent his pregnant wife home to have her baby, and he went on the run. He traveled by car and plane all over the U.S. Finally, he bought a one-way ticket to Mexico. The plane made a stop in Dallas on the way, and that is where the FBI took him off the plane. It was 4 January, 1969. He learned that Susan had given birth to a boy. The ticket agent had seen his face on a wanted poster. The FBI caught him with a gun in his pants, so he was charged with attempted hijacking of the aircraft. Plus, all the bad checks, bail jumping, the stolen cars, boats, and furniture. Later, the skyjacking was dropped because he never showed the gun to anyone. The FAA had a Dr. Hubbard, and he was fascinated with skyjackers. He interviewed Garrett extensively and wrote a book on his talks with him. Garrett told him that he was going to hijack the plane, but the FBI arrested him before he could start. Who knows if it was true or not? His lawyer said it was not. The doctor said it was. Garrett told a lot of stories to a lot of people. Back in L.A., Dr. DeNolfo was appointed by the court to test Garrett's sanity. On 30 September 1969, he was released from custody. The doctor reported that Garrett was temporarily insane at the time of the crimes and was not responsible. He had given the psychiatrist a first-rate snow job. He put on such a show that most doctors would have been taken in, but Garrett had talked about how he had impersonated an Italian, and that poor doctor must suffer from the prejudice of non-Italians too. Now, if you want to know about the, the rest of the trap nail story, I'll, I'll be putting it on. And please join my, um, as a patron, on patreon.com slash as the key turns. You can join for as little as a dollar. Um, on YouTube, you'll only get 50 or 12 free videos with a lot of commercials. But on Patreon, you can get as much as 50 in a year. Uh, commercial free or close to it. Now, if you'd like to write me an email, you certainly can. It's as the key turns at mail.com, or uh, you can join us on uh, social media in uh, as the key turns on Facebook. And thanks for watching the video. Now, this story of Garrett's just goes on and on, so there'll be more episodes about him and his other crimes than the one that landed him in the prison where I was at. So hang in there on Patreon. I, I would like to thank you for joining and uh, hit the like button down there if you would please.